Welcome, however. Um, but before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to uh, do a safety brief, which is uh, Okay, so uh, I also ask you to either put your uh, electronic devices on stun or mute so we don't have any interruptions in the middle of the program. Uh, we, we are recording today's uh, talk, so we ask that before you uh, ask a question that you raise your hand, get one of these handheld microphones so that we can hear your uh, question on the tape. Uh, and, in, and as usual, afterwards, we'll, we should have some refreshments in the lobby of Building 200. Well, it's a really a, a, a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Ken Caldera, sort of a hero of mine. Uh, he's one of the leading climate scientists in the world. And he works at Carnegie uh, Institute, Department of Global e uh, Ecology, at, located at Stanford University. Uh, his PhD is in atmospheric sciences from New York University. His general interests are very wide ranging and include uh, ocean acidification, uh, numerical simulation of climate and biogeochemistry, the global carbon cycle, uh, intentional intervention into the climate system, also known as geoengineering, and also he's quite an expert in energy technology and policy. He has recently been profiled in the San Francisco Chronicle and on NPR's All Things Considered. Uh, he has uh, su submitted papers to the New Yorker uh, magazine and to the New York Times. Uh, he was named Hero Scientist of 2008 by uh, New Scientist magazine. And in, in the bottom line, he's one of the leading climate scientists in the country with a message that everyone should hear. And so it's with great pleasure I ask uh, Ken Caldera to give us a talk today. Well, thank you, Stephanie. I don't know if I really live up to all that, but anyway. Um, yeah, so rather than giving like a, a normal talk, I thought I would just take like a few slides from a whole bunch of different things we've done over the last few years and just spend a few minutes on a whole bunch of different things. So it's kind of more of a sampler plate than a normal science talk. So um, yeah, so the, the other thing is, uh, you know, that people talk about interdisciplinary science and we just do undisciplined science and that we just kind of do uh, whatever whatever uh, seems interesting at the moment. And so my basic strategy is to hire good postdocs and, and who are interested in interesting things and then try to encourage them to do good work and let me be co-author on their papers. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so just to say what you know, I, I do have a habit of saying my opinion somewhere, and I do in my science, uh, you know, think that, you know, that science is about factual statements, and I do try to keep uh, in my own mind and in my professional work this sort of dis distinction between what's the domain of science and what's the domain of, you know, what we ought to do. And, you know, I, I do think that the, um, you know that that your values and so on helps frame helps you decide what questions you think are important. But that once you um, you know ask those questions, that you try just to answer them as objectively as you can. A and so in my scientific papers, I try to avoid as much value judgment as possible. But in my sort of normal talking, I'm happy to say what I think. The, uh, yeah, so just my basic framing for thinking about this whole problem is that, you know, that we, we have this desire for improved well-being that leads us to want to consume goods and services, and that leads to the consumption of energy, which in that consumption of energy is leading to CO2 emissions, which is leading to more CO2 in the atmosphere, which is leading to climate change and ocean acidification that's impacting on humans and ecosystems and could potentially at least negatively impact on our desire to improve our well-being. And so, 
there's a bunch of uh, intervention points along the way. And so conservation uh, is, it attempts to achieve, you know, achieve a level of well-being while consuming less. Uh, efficiency tries to make the things we consume with fewer material or energy inputs. Low carbon energy systems like uh, solar or wind uh, allow us to consume energy without producing the CO2 emissions. This idea of uh, carbon dioxide removal from the air uh, is trying to break this link between CO2 emissions and CO2 in the atmosphere. And uh, then this site controversial idea of solar geoengineering tries to break this link between accumulation of greenhouse gases and amount of climate change. And then adaptation, you could think of as trying to reduce the damages from some amount of climate change. And so you know, I think this problem is challenging enough that uh, we need to look at all of these things. And obviously, they're, they're not with the same level of effort. But uh, uh, and sort of broadly, in my research program, we've been looking at m many of these things, especially sort of the ones along this end of the spectrum. So uh, th this is just a, you know, before there's been a number of uh, scenarios that have been used by a no modeling groups. And the latest round of scenarios are these uh, representative concentration pathways. And I, I guess on this one, I took off the six. But uh, there's d different uh, pathways in terms of annual CO2 emissions leading to uh, uh, you know, different uh, trajectories uh, leading to different um, uh, amounts of radiative forcing, different amounts of warming. And so I'm going to use these at a couple of points. But uh, the basic thing here is that this uh, 2.6 one uh, more or less stabilizes at about two degrees above peri-industrial, uh, where the 4.5, you know, there's big error bars around these, around three degrees above pre-industrial. And, um, you know, this RCP 8.5 might be something like nine degrees above pre-industrial. And so one thing, uh, uh, I just had a, wrote a perspectives piece on this paper in climate change. And the paper was about coral refugia, but th this paper, Meaning that oh that some corals would go, you know, succumb to bleaching a few decades after other corals, and so I took the data from this paper and just plotted it. This is the fraction of model grid cells that don't experience annual bleaching. The idea is that if it gets hot and corals bleach year after year, uh, that they're probably unsustainable, and and, and so this uh, I mean sort of the bad news is that even uh, this R. CP 2.6, even under this projection, uh, at least on this measures of sustainability of coral reefs, the, um, the, that you know, almost every reef is experiencing annual bleaching by the end, end of the century, uh, even under RCP 2.6. And again, this is, you know, this is more closer to what most people think of as a business as usual scenario. And, this RCP 2.6 is pretty dramatic, and things are looking, just from a thermal point of view, pretty bad, uh, even on the more um, conservative emissions trajectories. And in part, uh, you know, if you think of what are the CO2 emissions from volcanoes and mid-ocean ridges and so on, it's you know, on the order of two orders of magnitude smaller than our current fossil fuel CO2 emissions and land use change emissions. And so, Another way of thinking of that if we cut back our emissions by 98% or 99%, we'd still be doubling the background volcanic uh, emissions. And, and it's still, so even something like RCP 2.6, which seems like really uh, unreasonably ambitious from a social point of view, is still a pretty big uh, change from a climate system point of view. So. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing work on is this uh, idea of ocean acidification. Now, we're all aware of carbon dioxide having physics effects on the climate system. But uh, and we know that also on, on land plants that it has chemical effects and that CO2 acts to fertilize plants. But in the oceans, um, the CO2 has an important effect on carbonate minerals. And here I just have a little cartoon here. And so this is you know, water. and. And this is supposed to be the, uh, representing how CO2 is predominantly dissolved in seawater. And so most, something like 80 percent, or m more than 80 percent of, uh, maybe, uh, of uh, CO2 is in the form of bicarbonate. Something like 10 percent is in the form of carbonate ions. Uh, 
closer to maybe 90% in the form bicarbonate. And so what happens when we add, C and this is calcium carbonate, which you can think of as a shell or a skeleton of a marine organism. And so when you add CO2 to the uh, system, or when you add it to the atmosphere, it comes through the sur dissolves uh, into the surface waters, and it reacts with the water molecule to become carbonic acid. And in the pH conditions of seawater, this is unstable, and a proton comes off. And so when people are talking about the uh, pH of the uh, ocean going down, they mean the activity of this hydrogen ion is going up, or, or, uh, uh, which is another way of saying the water is becoming more acidic, although it still has pH greater than 7. Anyway, this proton, in addition to doing a bunch of other things, um, can react with the carbonate ion, which is one of the building blocks for making calcium carbonate skeletons. And so by reacting with this carbonate ion, it changes the chemical equilibria. And in high enough concentrations, adding CO2 will f cause shells and skeletons to dissolve. And in lower concentrations, it, um, it doesn't actually cause them to dissolve, but it makes it uh, you know, thermodynamically more expensive for the organism to, to precipitate its mineral and so adds a metabolic cost to, uh, ca to making carbonate skeletons or shells, which then can make them ecologically disadvantaged. So, um, yeah, we just had a, a paper uh, come out last week in uh, Environmental Research Letters where we took these same scenarios and th there's been uh, a, a bunch of modeling groups, uh, about 20 model, different models did at least some of the simulations for uh, running these CO2 scenarios into the future. And uh, I forget the exact number of them, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, many of the groups had carbon cycle models with ocean car carbon biology represented, ocean carbon cycle represented. And so what we did is we took um, the uh, a, uh, observations of ocean chemistry, mostly from the mid-90s, uh, that were gridded, and then took the median values, and in the paper we do the distribution as well, but the median values from this CMIP-5 ensemble, and, and then looked at uh, these little white dots represent the locations of coral reefs, and so then what we did is we plot what, what fraction of coral reefs are in waters with different omega aragonite. And omega aragonite is a measure of the chemical potential that's driving the production of calcium carbonate shells. And, and I forget the exact number, but it's something like 99.9% .9 of the reefs uh, were surrounded by open ocean waters that were three and a half times or more saturated. And, um, and, and so, you know, so, ba so what basically we said is, okay, well, you might take the pre-industrial uh, distribution of the reefs as some indication that this, maybe this three and a half is a, some kind of environmental threshold that constrains where reefs can grow, but we also looked at 3.25 and 3 as, as possible uh, candidate thresholds. And, and um, so, yeah, so one of the things, so then we're looking at these different scenarios. So the, at this 2.6 scenario, which is the great, uh, where, where you really reduce the CO2 emissions from, um, the, it says, okay, what fraction of the reefs are, uh, you know, ha, are surrounded by open ocean waters with greater than these different threshold levels? And, and so that, again, even that 2.6, uh, and, you know, so today, you know, pre-industrial, almost all the reefs were above three. And uh, I mean, above 3.5. And so even with 2.6, which is a great reduction in emissions, only about a third of the reefs will stay above those conditions. If the reefs are a little more resilient, you know, maybe 80% of them would survive. But e the point is that even 2.6 is a, is a pretty major, uh, while it would be an amazing thing if we could achieve it from an emissions point of view, from the reefs point of view, is still a fairly threatening thing. Then, but if you go to these sort of RCP 4.5s or, or 8.5s, uh, you know, certainly by, if you're in the 8.5 trajectory somewhere not long after mid-century, uh, you know, there's no place left in the oceans with, um, with the kind of seawater chemistry that has supported coral reef growth in the past. Uh, you know, and so again, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, the, 
I mean, these scenarios, even most people think if we could achieve RCP 4.5, it would be some sort of miracle. So that, um, and you know, my, if you take the, the, the historical distribution that uh, this sort of 3.5 is probably a reasonable threshold. And so again, even with, with pretty strong measures on, on emissions reductions, things look pretty grim for the reefs from both a chemical point of view and a temperature point of view. That's just the same thing. So this one is just this thing animated. So this goes from uh, 1860 to 2100 for the RCP 8.5 scenario. And the um, you know the basic uh, the basic upshot is that by the end of the century, the you know right you know in the pre-industrial area to era, all the coral reefs were in these blue colors, and maybe just a little bit into the the blue greens. And uh, you know here we are about today. It was around close to 400. Is maybe something like a third of the reefs might be unsustainable, and by the end of the century. Uh, things are looking pretty grim. So, uh, yeah, so one of the things we found also is that it doesn't really, the rate of the increase in PCO2 doesn't matter for ocean surface chemistry on this decadal to century time scale. It's just the CO2 level that matters. And depending on what the threshold is, uh, you know, the, what the tolerance of reefs are for low saturation conditions. You know, it could be somewhere in this range before there's no water left in the oceans that can support reef growth. And so, yeah, so the basic point here is, I mean, this is sort of an end of century for RCP 8.5. This is pre-industrial. And the basic point is there's no overlap in the kind of chemistry that supported reef growth historically and what's likely to be in the ocean uh, by the end of the century as under a business as usual scenario. So anyway. So uh, this is mostly about modeling, but we're not just do, doing all modeling. So we looked at, um, in the 1960s uh, and 70s, and I guess into the early 80s, Donald Kinsey did a bunch of measurements of uh, reef growth. And he used a, just a geochemical approach where treating the reef as kind of a black body, measuring the water composition as it flows onto the reef and the water composition as it flows off the reef. and the difference in, in the, the concentrations times the flow rate gives you an estimate of the net flux of material into or out of the reef. And so he went and measured a number of reefs several decades ago. And so we thought, oh, let's go back and redo the same uh, thing that he did and see, see how our numbers compare with his numbers. And so this is the same place that he was at there. But this was a couple of years later. I mean, it's just a couple of years ago. And so we've now done several expeditions here, but this one is from uh, 2009. Uh, and, um, and so basically, we did the same kind of uh, things around the clock, measuring alkalinity and other, other chemical compositions as it flowed on and uh, you know, flowed. Anyway, uh, measured the seawater changes in seawater composition, and from that, inferred fluxes into net fluxes into or out of the reef. And uh, yeah, and so the basic story was that we got uh, rates of calcification about 40% lower than what Kinsey got. And now, the, any one set of measurements like this is, is, is kind of anecdotal in that you're there different years and different weather conditions, and you might have been slightly different place. And so uh, you can't make too much out of any one measurement. We did some other. Uh, now, another place where Donald Kinsey went was Lizard Island, and it's the same kind of geometry. The water flowed across here, and we measured water coming on and coming off the reef. And it's just uh, you know, taking water samples there, and that's measuring salinity and so on. And again, uh, you know, so more or less around 40% less than what Kinsey got in the mid-1970s, and this time, one we went back in two different years. And so, you know, any one of these, I think, is anecdotal. But but if uh, you know the fact that we went to two separate reefs in a couple of years and got similar kind of numbers indicates that calcification rates might be down substantially from what it was a few decades ago, which is kind of consistent with uh, these projections of sometime around mid-century. These lines 
you know, basically that the reefs would get into a state where there's net dissolution. So the, the, this black is showing that there's, that there's dissolution going on at nighttime today, and, and as there was in the several decades ago. So, um, okay, this is just another, uh, just a, another kind of project. Steve Davis, who now just uh, started a job at UC Irvine, uh, actually an interesting guy because he, uh, he got a law degree, decided he didn't like contract law, got a PhD in geosciences studying Eocene river flow in the western U.S. and decided he didn't like that and then came worked with me on energy type issues. Uh, so, yeah, so one of the things we said, question was, well, wh what if we just take our existing devices and let them live out their normal lifetime so they're not like cars in Havana where they make them last forever, but what if we didn't build uh, you know, any more devices, how much CO2 would get released from what we now have. And I guess I, I went into this thinking that, that um, we were already had enough stuff built to send us over this sort of two degree threshold or over 450 ppm. And I was sort of surprised uh, that, um, that uh, actually how little warming is embedded in existing CO2 emitting devices. So this, this came out a couple years ago now uh, in science. And, and so ba basically what Steve did is, um, you know, get stocks of power plants and their, what are their ages in different countries and uh, tried to estimate similar kinds of numbers for automobiles and so on and just said, okay, for the, all these devices that emit CO2, what's, what's their lifetime and how much CO2 might they emit? And, um, and so, you know, as you can guess, the big thing for emissions is really this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, commercial energy, electricity sector, uh, you know, transportation's obviously also important. Uh, and then in this case, it was broken down by country. And one of the interesting things is that while China's emissions are just, to, well, today slightly bigger than those of the United States, that the um, amount of uh, sort of, of emissions embodied in their existing infrastructures is 211 gigatons compared to 84 for the US. And so while we have similar stocks of CO2 emitting devices, the ones in the United States tend to be old and closer to retirement, whereas China's uh, CO2 emitting devices are for the most part relatively new and, and have a lot of lifetime in front of them. And, and so, you know, the, but the interesting thing is that, you know, these numbers go down pretty quickly. They don't look that different from this RCP 2.6 scenario. Uh, and, and if you look at what, what's the amount of warming, uh, of CO2 concentrations and warming that, that would uh, come from these emission trajectories, then more or less, you know, we're already at, uh, you know, close to 400 today. I mean, this was based on, I think, 2005 numbers. But, uh, you know, more or less, it peaks out only at, you know, less than 420, maybe 410, something like this. So that, that, that uh, and that, again, it depends on climate sensitivity, but if you calibrate the model to give us sort of 0.8 in, or close to 0.8 in, in 2000, which is close to uh, sort of the IPCC canonical number for the warming to that date, that you know, you get something on the order of uh, you know 1.2 degrees or something warming over pre-industrial, which um, you know says to me that the most of the threat of climate change is from devices that we have yet to build and not from existing infrastructure. And now, the, sorry to jump around between scenarios. This has been going back to the older S-Res scenarios, but um, but you know if th this is um, you know three different potential trajectories uh, of emissions under the older uh, IPCC set of scenarios. A and as you can see, this is sort of the, well, this is the emission under their scenarios are high, middle, low, and I usually think of high as being closer to, to normal business as usuals. That, that, you know, most of this emissions coming from stuff that, that is yet to be built, and, and the amount of emissions that comes from things that are already built is relatively minor. And so, um, anyway, so the basic upshot of this study was that the uh, primary threat from climate change are not from existing CO2 emitting devices, but from devices that we've yet to build. And that the, but that the, the caveat in all this is that 
Um, you know, we looked at emissions from automobiles and power plants and so on, but uh, you know, there's a lot of other infrastructure that helps support that. You have factories that build the cars. You have uh, uh, gas stations that uh, provide fuel for the cars, and they don't necessarily emit CO2 themselves, but, but it makes it harder to, to build other infrastructure. You know, you can't have an electric car infrastructure if there's no recharging stations. So then um, there, was a, uh, uh, there was a paper way back when on, on you know, this idea that we could take seven different technologies and cobble them together and deploy these seven wedges, and that would help us to stabilize climate. And, and um, so we took uh, you know, that, which is, again, a fairly Herculean task. So the idea of these wedges is that they're something you deploy over 50 years and they ramp up to a gigaton of carbon per year avoided emissions. And the basic upshot is that if you do this Herculean thing, that you're just, um, so this, this is a business as usual scenario, this A2, and this is that same scenario with avoiding the seven wedges of emissions. And the basic uh, thing is that you're getting to barely detectable levels of, uh, of warming avoidance in that 50 year period and that the main benefit of, of doing this energy system transition comes in the second half of the century and not in the first half of the century. So, um, you know, while these uh, transitions are really important to do, that, uh, you know, the primary benefit is going to come from in the second half of the century. I mean, one thing to be aware of, if you're doing any linear transition, so three quarters of the benefit of three quarters of the emissions that you avoid occur in the second half of the transition, and so um, uh, you know, the, and that whole infrastructure that you haven't com emitted converted yet is still emitting while you're doing the conversion, and so it's really hard to see substantial climate benefits through just energy system transitions over the first half of the century. But, but it can produce substantial benefits in the second half of the century. I can just jump past that. Yeah, so then what we did is looked at, um, this is a, another paper in Environmental Research Letters. Uh, well, we, I can just show this one slide. That, and this one we're redoing. What we looked at is these, this, in this case, a 40-year transitions of a one terawatt coal system to technologies and had a simple uh, model that had methane and CO2 in it. And, thermal inertia of the ocean and you know, the radiative balance of the planet and did, uh, took uh, data from life cycle assessments of various energy technologies and then looked at the amount of warming that would occur uh, under, under these various transitions. And we're redoing this. I think you could, uh, you know, we used a relatively efficient coal plant in this, which makes coal look a little better than it maybe should, which then makes transitions to other technologies look a little worse than they probably should. The, um, the, uh, so basically, this black line represents continued operation of a one terawatt coal facility, which is uh, that's not too far from, uh, in term, uh, from the scale of the current electricity generation system globally. And then if you phase that over 40 years to pure conservation, you get this much warming. That's from the CO2 and so on that came while you're phasing out. And then the, this um, range of colors is what we got for different models where the range is represented by the life cycle assessment literature. And you know, one of the places we got um, you know, we didn't make any value judgments on the life cycle assessment literature. We just sort of said, well, if it got published in a major journal, we'll just include it. And so some of these more pessimistic numbers on carbon capture and storage are probably not plausible. And so if you're optimists about technologies, you should look at probably the, the more, uh, the lower bound of these, uh, of these curves. And if you're sort of pessimistic about the potential for technologies, maybe then look at the upper bound. And I guess the most controversial one is this, natural gas because, um, you know, and what f fraction of benefit do you get from moving from coal to natural gas? And uh, under the best of possible circumstances, natural gas would be somewhere here in the middle, uh, sort of half of what coal does. And so uh, a lot of 
this uncertainty about whether natural gas should sit here or should be sit up here depends on what you assume about leakage in, uh, you know, upstream at the at the mine, you know, the where they're uh, extracting natural gas. And then the other issue comes from natural gas in some places, like in Japan, is used liquid natural gas, which has all these compression costs. But so the basic upshot, though, is it looks like you can get some tens of percents of emissions per kilowatt hour saved by going to natural gas, but that if you really want to get dramatic reductions in temperature, that, that it's really the sort of solar, wind, and photovoltaics, and nuclear that show the most promise. And, and I guess carbon capture and storage at the bottom end, too, which is probably reasonable. Hydroelectric has a huge spread, and it's mostly, this has a big latitudinal distribution, and it's mostly tro methane from tropical uh, dams is a huge, can make more warming than coal over a period of several decades. So uh, this one is with Bala, who's, I believe, in the audience. Uh, this is work we did some years ago, but we've done follow-up work on this. Uh, but uh, but the uh, basic story is the same, and that we did these uh, simulations where we took uh, a coupled climate carbon model and had it, uh, you know, subjected it to this uh, uh, business as usual emission scenario, and then we had a, a, a parallel run where we did the same thing, but we cut down every forest in the uh, on the planet. And in the model, anyway, the, despite cutting down the, the, every forest on the planet and the CO2 being higher in the atmosphere, the temperatures were about the same, or if anything, slightly cooler uh, on, the, uh, on the planet without forests. And the other sort of surprising thing is you know, we had expected when we first ran this that there would be a pulse of CO2 uh, coming out into the atmosphere, but that these two lines would converge as time went on as the oceans and maybe residual land biosphere took up additional carbon. Now, this, I have to do say that this land carbon model is more uh, subject to uh, CO2 fertilization than most uh, land carbon cycle models. But what happens here is um, in the standard case, you have forests, and those forests can respond to CO2 fertilization. And so you're increasing forest biomass here, and that's helping to keep the CO2 levels down in this standard uh, business as usual scenario. Whereas in this scenario, you not only lose the CO2 as this organic matter decays uh, when you chop down the forest, but then it also removes that amount of bio that biomass can no longer uh, achieve, uh, can no longer be fertilized, and so it also takes up less CO2, and so these these two trajectories don't converge on each other, but, but continue to diverge. So then the question is, OK, if this one has more CO2 in it, why is this one cooler? And the basic story is that forests tend to be darker than, uh, than non-forests. And this is especially true in snowy areas where a snow-covered forest is, still substan is substantially darker than a snow-covered field. And oops, I went the wrong way. So. Um, so anyway, so th this is what this, the temperatures look like in map view. And so you have small warming uh, through, distributed throughout the southern hemisphere where ocean dominates and where the boreal, primarily where boreal forests are, downwind from boreal forests, you see a strong cooling influence despite the fact that cutting down the forest is throwing all kinds of carbon into the atmosphere. So it's throwing carbon into the atmosphere. It's not warming anything up. And so one of the questions was, well, uh, gee whiz, if you cut down forests the world over, and even though that increases CO2, if it makes Europe and North America cooler, uh, is that cooling because of something going on locally, or is that uh, some, you know, you're cooling the high latitudes and somehow that's the coolness or the heat that's causing heat to diffuse n northward? And so we did three additional simulations where we cut down forests only north of 50 degrees between uh, 20 uh, and 50 uh, degrees in each hemisphere. And then the tropical case, uh, where it's just um, cut down uh, between 20 north and 20 south. A and what you see is in the boreal case, there's a strong cooling influence by cutting down the forest. And that's because you're basically leaving snowy fields to reflect light 
and that, that strongly dominates over the CO2-induced warming. In the tropics, it's the opposite case uh, that you, first of all, you're getting this strong CO2-induced warming from all the carbon that were in the tropical forest, but also uh, you can get, um, and this is a model-dependent response, that some models at least get uh, the, that the reduced evapotranspiration when you cut down the forest reduces low clouds, and by losing low cloudiness, even though you're getting a darker surface, um, you know, even though that uh, cutting down the forest lightens the surface, if you cut down the forest, you then can also lose some low clouds, which instead of seeing a cloud from top of space, you see the surface, and so you, so you can get a, a biophysical warming effect from tropical deforestation. And in the case of the temperate regions, it seemed that, again, the magnitudes are smaller, but more or less the overall response is where you're cutting down the forest, you're getting a little bit of cooling due to this change in surface reflectivity, but then the CO2 is warming other places. And then this becomes a political, politically harder sell if you're saying, well, we're going to cut, if you want to go the other way and say we're going to grow forests, well, we might actually warm up if we grew forests in the United States, but it would cool down other places. And so is that good or bad or who knows what? And the, um, so one of the things I would say is that this is a coarse resolution model and is indicative. Other groups have since done this and come up with comparable results. The, um, we did a follow-up study looking at uh, areas in the boreal forests not in such an idealized way, but looking at places where farmers actually cut down land and grew uh, stuff in the historical past. And one of the things that, that, that farmers don't just choose random land, they like to choose sunny you know, areas, south-facing slopes, places that are more productive, which tend to have more carbon, and also places that are not so snowy. Uh, and, and so all of those things go opposite this sign here. So if you take an area that's not so snowy, well, that, that you're going to have less of a reflectivity case uh, effect. If you like biologically rich and productive areas, well, that means when you convert that land, you're probably going to have more carbon emissions. And so uh, it looks as if, again, not a huge uh, magnitude, but that it looks as if you, if you actually take locations where people have deforested boreal regions historically, that there might be a cooling effect of restoring forest in those areas, even if there's a, an overall uh, cooling effect of, of forest in boreal regions. So anyway, the main story is that th these idealized studies might, may or may not be good guide to policy at a local scale. but. Uh, but I think the general trends are probably uh, robust. Um, yeah, one of the interesting things in this simulation, if you look at the CO2, that actually the cutting down boreal forests only didn't even have any resulting increase in CO2 levels because you cut down the boreal forests and you cooled, um, you, you, you cut down the boreal forest, you cool the high latitudes, and then that that cooling reduced respiration rates in the mid-latitudes, allowing the mid-latitude forests to grow more biomass and it actually took up the CO2 that was released at the high latitudes. So in, at least in these simulations, the uh, cutting down the boreal forest did not add any CO2 to the atmosphere on net and, and did produce a cooler uh, climate. So uh, yeah, so then uh, I'll just do a couple more then once. Yeah, there's always one um, thing that bugged me about this, this question of, uh, you know, people always talk about evaporative cooling. And, and, and then you say, well, gee whiz, that that water has to condense somewhere else. And so really, you know, if you're doing evaporative cooling, you're also heating up somewhere. And so does, it, does evaporating water lead to global cooling? Or is that just a, a transfer of energy from one place to another? And it's really complicated because you can think, well, water vapor itself is a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, but it makes clouds, and clouds have radiative effect. And then there's also something called the lapse rate. And if you have more water in the atmosphere, then the, the, you have a shallower lapse rate, so the surface temperature is closer to the radiating temperature of the planet, which means that then that should be a colder temperature. And so you know, how do all these things play together? 
And so we just did this idealized study of saying we'll take one watt per meter, square meter everywhere and instead of having it come off in sensible heat, let's just have it come out as uh, water vapor or latent heat and see what that does to the climate system. And, um, and so, the, yeah, so without going in too much detail, um, the, uh, the basic uh, dominant effect, at least in the CAM and CARS model, climate model, is that this increased evaporative flux caused more low clouds and for that each uh, watt of energy that went into evaporating water on average, somewhere between a half a watt and a three quarters of a watt uh, of shortwave radiation got sent out to space due to the creation of low clouds. And so, you know, something like somewhere between half and three quarters of all the energy that goes into evaporating water or any additional energy that would go into evaporating water, about half to three quarters of that energy would get uh, transferred to space through its effect on low clouds if you believe this model. And so the upshot was that that increased evaporation, again, in this model, uh, not only causes local cooling, but, uh, but global cooling as well through its effect on planetary albedo. And, uh, this is something we've wanted to follow up but haven't had time to because you can imagine where doing the same land cover change in different places might have very different climate effects so that if you're upwind from some place where there are clouds forming and you add a little more water vapor to the air, well maybe you'll, include, you'll increase cloud fraction but maybe if you're upwind from a desert and you evaporate a little more water upwind from that, maybe you'll end up just uh, you know, increasing the relative humidity, but you might not form a cloud, and, and, and so the, that effect of that increased evaporation could be very different in different places. And so, uh, and this is sort of a general thing that, I mean, the same kinds of arguments could be made about surface roughness or uh, other ways in which land cover change affects la the, the climate system. And so I think this question of how, how does, how would the same land cover change affect climate differentially depending on where it happens. It's an interesting one. So, uh, okay, so this is then, maybe I'll make this the last one, I can do one more after that. Um, we did the, the study of uh, uh, the, how much uh, energy is there in wind power? Uh, and again, this is another NCAR um, uh, CAM study, so just using a global GCM. And so the basic concepts are there's some kind of swept area of a wind turbine, and then uh, that this uh, out of each out of the wind turbine it captures kinetic energy, some fraction of the kinetic energy flowing through it, and so you can think of that as an effective area. And what's amazing is a wind turbine like this will get over half the energy flowing through there, despite the fact that just a few percent of the disk area is is covered by blade, but. But, uh, and so then we lo looked at scaling up the amount of uh, effective area for capturing wind energy, both in the b boundary layer. And then there's this other idea of putting sort of merging kite technologies with wind turbine technologies and flying wind turbines high in the atmosphere, which we looked at that as well. And so, um, yeah, so just, you know, so right now the, the total energy, uh, thermal energy used by civilizations around 18 terawatts. And so, you know, this was just a real geophysical experiment where we put drag either uniformly throughout the boundary layer or through the near surface atmosphere or through the entire volume of the atmosphere. And um, this is the same numbers on a log log scale, so you can kind of get if it was one, slope of one means as you each put each turbine, you're, you know, if it's a double number of the turbines, you're doubling the number of power generated, but at some point you start slowing down the winds and, and, and you, uh, you, know, you double the number of turbines, but you, you've slowed down the winds so much that you're getting far less than twice the winds. And, that the, and the conclusion here was that for near surface winds, you know, some, you know, again, we're, I think 18 terawatts is, uh, is the, current power demand. And so you're still for near surface winds very much in the linear regime and same thing for whole atmosphere winds. The, 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 um, uh, and so one of the other surprising things of this study is that this uh, amount of extraction is uh, at least as big as the total amount of uh, 
uh, production rate of kinetic energy in the atmosphere, and so how could we be potentially taking more energy out than is being produced? Oh, oh, let me go to that next. Oh, so then the other, this is, so we took, uh, this is now about 20, this is now taking numbers around here, 400 terawatts of this is like 20 times, 25 times what civilization is using, and looking at just the temperature uh, changes. Uh, and this is if you put the wind turbines along the surface of the Earth, and this is through the whole atmosphere, North Pole, South Pole. And so there's something like, uh, you know, at this scale, there, there's something like, you know, a half degree to a degree temperature change. And I, I can talk about the signs, but, but, you know, let's say you divide, divide at the scale of civilization, this means that wind power might be something like a tenth of a degree in terms of zonal average temperature changes. And then if you look at the effects at this scale of precipitation, again, we can't just do it on 18 terawatts because of the signal to noise. So we're sort of doing these calculations on you know, something that's 25 times bigger than multiplying, divided by 25. But again, the, the changes in precipitation at the scale of civilization, at least on the zonal mean, would be something like 1%. And so you know, compared to, uh, there's some people who saying that the climate effects of wind turbines will be so huge that it makes them comparably bad to coal or natural gas or something. And I just think that's not true, at least uh, as far as our studies say. But the, um, yeah, so uh, maybe I don't have time to go into this. But the interesting thing is that the, um, the, um, the as you remove uh, surface wind turbines, just take out energy that would have otherwise dissipated at the surface of the planet. Whereas if you put a, a kite out high in the atmosphere, the climate system responds to that removal of momentum by uh, adding additional, producing additional uh, kinetic energy momentum in the atmosphere. And we're trying to figure out why that is now. And I think it has to do with sea ice feedbacks, but it's current study. OK. I will just jump past there. So let me just do, um, yeah, let me just do the last thing we're doing here. And this is some geoengineering stuff. And so this is a you know, basic simulation like what Bala and I did uh, in 2000, where you double CO2 and then you block some sunlight. And typically, uh, uh, you, you can either do this with aerosols or just in a model by turning down the sun. And typically, this reduces the RMS temperature difference by something like 90%. And then, uh, oops, uh, what happened there? I'm going backwards. And then for precipitation, uh, it's a similar story. But uh, you know, the, the CO2 warms up everywhere, and turning down the sun cools down everywhere. And so that went straight forward. Whereas with precipitation, some places are getting wetter, some places are getting drier. But still, if you, um, if you deflect say a little bit less than 2% of the sunlight away per CO2 doubling, you reduce the RMS difference for the precipitation by something like 70%. And this, these little red dots here have been of concern in that Alan Robach uh, said, OK, this could potentially lead to billions of people dying of starvation and so on. And so we decided to take a look at that by, by putting a crop model and uh, using two different GCMs for the crop model and making crop projections based on uh, you know, that model. Oh, yeah, I, oh, this is just back to the physical science things. And this is just showing this, these red lines, thick lines over land, thin lines global. Blue line is uh, land. Uh, you know, it's blue line is the geoengineered case. And showing that, you know, again, then sort of something like a 90% RMS reduction, even at a grid point by grid point level for, uh, for temperature, and something like a 70% uh, improvement for the hydrological variables. So yeah, so one of the reasons why this came uh, as of interest is it, this is a uh, paper by Batiste and now are looking at the end of the century. Uh, showing how, at least in the climate models, almost every summer is hotter than the hottest summer yet on record. And the question is, you know, will this, could this potentially lead to crop failures? And if China is having decade after decade of crop failures, might they be induced to do something, you know, to deploy a system like this? 
And so one of the things we wanted to look at is, well, what would this mean for crops? And um, the, um, yes, yeah, so, and the, uh, anyway, the basic upshot, so, okay, this is the two times CO2 case, and the black line is the net of three effects, CO2 fertilization, changes in precipitation, and changes in temperature. And um, the, uh, and in this particular model, it's actually coming up with, uh, because of CO2 fertilization, getting higher yields uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the tropical areas. But that, the, uh, you know, I don't want to argue for this particular crop model, but, the, um, but basically you're nullifying almost all of the direct climate effects and you're just left with the CO2 effects, uh, and depending on how much strong of a fertilizer you think CO2 is, that could either be zero, or I think in this model it's something like 15% increase in yields due to CO2 fertilization. But the, um, you know, and so anyway, um, the, I mean, the basic upshot is, again, you don't necessarily, have, even if you don't, the effects of CO2 fertilization are in the same, in both cases, and more or less, uh, you know, if you look at the red line, at least in, the, in this crop model and for some others, the main factor of climate change that reduces crop yields is heat stress and increased respiration rates. And this, basically the geoengineering, uh, at least in this model, reduces the heat stress and increases crop yields relative to what they would be in the absence of the geoengineering. I don't, uh, anyway, there's all kinds of caveats, like this is existing crops and existing areas and it doesn't allow motion and so on. But the basic uh, story is uh, it, at least, uh, you know, with two different GCMs and one crop model, that the crop yields went up in a geoengineered world despite the small reduction in amount of sunlight. So I, I think I'll just stop there and open it up for questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I can. I interesting about the, the changing the albedo and that effect by, by uh, eliminating the forests. How much did you actually change in that uh, scenario? I'm just remembering a random fact that at least for a description of the tropical atmosphere, the, um, the people modeling Brazil found there was a huge effect on the wind stress uh, as, as a result of, of deforestation, and that seemed to swamp even albedo. So, did you have any comments on? Did you did you did you change that also? Yeah, no. I mean, this. I mean, in this case, it was just removing all forests, and that's why. So, it would change surface roughness and change latent heat fluxes and change albedo and all this. And this is and this. evapotranspiration. So, you got that far. Yeah, but the, and but that's we're starting to go down that road of trying to look at one at a time. But um, you know, we didn't get to the point of isolating effects of changes in wind stress. So, so, so you didn't have a wind stress effect at all? It, there was, no, there, there was, from the land surface model, from removing okay. the forest had changed surface roughness, okay. but I don't know what fraction of the effect was from surface roughness. But my guess is it's mostly just surface albedo in that model. Uh, thank you. Uh, I recently read uh, the opinion of one of German climate scientist, I don't remember his name, unfortunately, that uh, the uh, observation uh, shows uh, much uh, lower rise uh, in uh, global temperature. It's still rising, but much lower than uh, global climate models are predicting. And he uh, said that uh, it's difficult to explain this difference. So, uh, what can you say about that? Yeah, so yeah, more or less for the last decade or so, well, even though it's been the hottest decade on record, there's no uh, 
not any strong discernible slope in that last decade. So things have pretty, has pretty much leveled off, maybe a little bit more than a decade. And, uh, and so you know, if you think there's some radiative forcing from CO2, that uh, you know, the, there's only a few different things that can happen to that heat. It can go into the ocean, or it can go out to space. And then there's the other question of aerosols and cloud effects, and uh, how, uh, you know what? Uh, what's the sort of uh, negative forcing that's coming from those? And the, um, I mean, the, there are. Uh, a number of scientists who are thinking that climate sensitivity might be towards the lower end of that, you know, that, you know, the classic range that people have been saying for the last 20 years is one and a half to four and a half degrees per CO2 doubling. And I remember when I was a graduate student, people were saying two degrees, and now they're saying, then they went to saying three degrees. And I think I hear more people saying two degrees again, but I don't know. Uh, you, you know, I think a lot depends on. Well, how good do you think the ocean heat uptake measurements are? And um, and then the uh, this other, I guess the another question is how strong, how negative, how much negative forcing is from aerosols? And uh, you know, I think I mean, we were talking at lunch that it seems like if if there was a way to measure Earth's radiation balance more accurately, that this would help. You know, basically, we know the surface temperature, and we know the top of atmosphere balance, and we know how much heat's going to the ocean. I think we would have this problem nailed, but there's just too much, um, you know, so a lot of uncertainty in all those numbers. But, but I think it's not unreasonable to think that climate sensitivity might be at the lower end of the oft-cited range. So, so I had a question on uh, on. How comfortable you were with the validity of, of the models that you're that you're using here, and what would you propose doing to increase? Is there experiments or or research that should be done to increase the validity of those models? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the way I look at what we're doing, it's kind of experiments on an Earth-like planet, and not, uh, you, you know, and I wouldn't. I mean, there was a, this is now ancient history, but there was a time around 19, early 90s, I did a, some study where I treated India-Asia collision area as a well-mixed box. And then we went there, and you see all this fine structure. And the things that would happen if it were a well-mixed box doesn't happen in reality. And so you know, a lot of things in models are like well-mixed boxes where reality has structure to it. Um, and uh, you know, so I, I think there's a room for different types of people doing different kinds of things. So I don't think there's like one kind of model. So I, you know, part of the answer is resolution and just representing more of that heterogeneity. But uh, you know, I also think that there's room for exploratory course resolution, thought experiment type things. But you know, other than um, I mean, obviously, we need for just, I mean, there's just a lot of process studies. We don't really know how clouds respond to different kinds of things. And, and then just observations of places, you know, if somebody is deforesting some huge area, you know, how do those clouds respond and the radiative fluxes respond? Uh, you know, if there, again, if there could be some really good Irby like top of atmosphere nailing down what the global energy budget is, I think, for a whole bunch of things, that would be great. Um, but I think, you know, I think with climate modeling, it, you know, you see the, I mean, the error bars, the uncertainty range hasn't really declined substantially in the last 20 some odd years. And, uh, you know, and as the models get more complex, the spread between models doesn't narrow. and. Um, you know, I is that troubling? It is, but I think we. I think that my. I think it's just a hard problem, right? There's so many different spatial scales. Uh, yeah, I mean, I. I really think. I mean, maybe it's just because I don't understand how hard it is to get top of atmosphere energy budget. But 
seems to me if we knew Earth's energy budget a little better, it would help a lot. Because then that would, if we could, if we could observe what's heat going into the ocean and what's coming out the top of atmosphere, I think we could estimate climate sensitivity pretty well. But I, I put it this way, I would more trust in getting it observationally than by improving the models. Um, uh, your, your research um, obviously spans many different time frames and sometimes you're looking at, for example, the year 2080 or 2100 and in other cases you're looking at the year 2300. Um, from your point of view, what is the, the kind of the time frame that we should be keeping in mind most if you had to pick one as, as far as kind of balancing the mass of uncertainty as you go even further into the future? Um, so, for example, which year is perhaps uh, the best metric of how well we're doing? Should we be looking at 2100? Is it looking too far in the future to look beyond that, for example? Yeah, I mean, now they're getting back to that first thing of values versus uh, science stuff. But, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, I mean, not to be glib, but I would say the year that should be used as the metric is probably 2013. You know, that, you know, that if we're not, because I think we know what we need to do in terms of transforming our energy system and that, um, you know, that I think sometimes putting these, uh, you know, some people want to have us thinking in terms of cumulative allowable emissions and, you know, but if you tell a politician that you have a thousand gigatons left to emit, the average politician's response is going to be like, oh, well, I don't have nothing to worry about in my term. And so, um, you know, I don't think, I think we might be at a point where additional climate science isn't going to influence policy. That, that uh, you know, I, I think climate science is more or less where it's plate tectonics was when it was taught in elementary schools and, and, um, and I think this residual uncertainty is about what exactly what climate sensitivity is is pretty uh, it's a pretty tough nut to crack, and that we might not reduce uncertainty in the next decade or two and that um, so you know I think that there might be a transformation in how people perceive the climate problem, but uh, it's not clear to me that more science is actually going to have any policy influence at all. We have one more question. Okay. Um, so as a former forester, I'm really interested in what you were talking about with forest management. Um, I found it was really interesting how you took the effect of a tree in, for example, a boreal forest versus a tropical forest and looked at the carbon um, sequestration or growth benefit that was done by either one. I'm just interested whether you could like give us some comments on the implications for forest management due to that, or um, more sp specifically, why you think temperate forests have less of a relative effect on carbon sequestration. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I think with the result that's fairly robust is the boreal forest one, because the difference in reflectivity between a snowy field and a snowy forest is, is large. And so I think everybody's uh, agreed on that one. And I, I guess the caveat there, and what does it mean in terms of forest management, is this follow-up study, which I didn't present to you, but we published last year, where uh, you know it turns out that the details in this heterogeneity matter, and that the, that it's not random land that's cleared, it's land that tends not to be so snowy, it's land that tends to be fertile, which is the one that could take up the most carbon and would have, and, and, um, and I was talking to Bala before, and you know, it seems like something about, you know, if this were done in terms of, well, how many snowy months are there a year, and then, you know, something that, because this is just latitude bands, but if you take, Seattle, where there's almost no snow, it's almost certain that putting a, far, a tree in Seattle is going to have a cooling influence. Even there, if some in North Dakota, it might have a warming influence. And so this just you need more direction for for planners. The the issue in the tropics, there's different models that have gotten different results. I would say that most. Uh, 
because it does tend to be cloudy and, the, and moist, that an additional water vapor in the atmosphere and tends to increase cloud fraction, that most, uh, and then that white clouds hide the dark forest, and so you get this kind of double cooling effect of, in the tropics of storing the carbon, but then also producing whiter clouds that reflect more sunlight. Now, there's at least one model I know of that doesn't get that cloud. Any time a climate model has a cloud-based result, some there's reason to be skeptical, but I think, I mean, there there have been some other groups looking into this, and um, you know, and I th and we did write one paper that had some guidelines for forest managers, which I could give to you. But I think that the science isn't that much more advanced th than to say well, the tropical ones are probably more cooling than you'd get from CO two alone and boreal ones, and I mean, this also got, gets into another question, I know we should end up here, but the, um, you know, what does it mean, uh, you know, you, you could argue that if the purpose of a climate regime is to, in part, to preserve natural ecosystems, that even if preserving that ecosystem has some warming influence, that it's still meeting the broader objectives of the overall effort to reduce carbon emissions to, to save that, and so if a boreal forest get saved as a byproduct, you know, that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and so maybe it's okay to use a carbon regime in that way. But that's a different question, so I'll just stop there. Okay, oh, I think we should thank our speaker again for a great talk. <laughs> and, and as usual, we have some uh, refreshments in the lobby, and uh, hopefully I'll see most of you here tomorrow. <laughs>